check, check, microphone check. Hello, is it C you're looking for? <laughs> yeah, that took me longer than the rap last week to figure out what I was going to do this morning. Uh, <laughs> I think we've gone to that point now where I'm spending just as much on the lecture to figure out what I'm going to do in the opening of each lecture for the microphone check. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to another week of Comp 1511. We have ramped up the course now, so the first two weeks was a lot of intro stuff, a lot of just sort of getting the hang of things. Um, hopefully everyone's got some kind of setup now where they can um, where they can code happily on their own at home and they've potentially got some way of still connecting to our resources at CSC and being able to um, uh, being being able to make sure you can run your tests and submit your labs and things like that. As usual, anyone having any problems, let us know. Um, we can always get someone to help you set things up if you need um, and uh, give you some support in in any way that that we that we can, I guess, to to make sure that you've got um, all the infrastructure around you that lets you learn uh, programming the way that we're teaching it. So now that we're sort of through the first two weeks of getting us into programming, we're going to be launching into the course full scale, as it were. So on Thursday this week, uh, we're going to have the first weekly test released. Um, what I'm hoping is that a fair bit of the first weekly test is um, reasonably easy for everyone because what it's going to be doing in a sense is testing what was presented in week one what was taught in the week two labs and then will be tested in the week three weekly test. So it's going to be really simple things like um, I think in the first week we only had variables and um, if statements I think. So it'll be what feels simple now that you've done some looping um, and even by the time the test comes out a lot of people will have already done um, this week's tutorial as well which has also got um, more stuff on looping which we covered last week. Uh, the other thing that's happening this week um, is that at the end of the week, we're aiming for Sunday, because Sunday is when we sort of roll over the, the, the content for the week usually, is that we'll be releasing the first assignment on Sunday. So the first assignment is going to um, give you a chance to put together a whole lot of what we've taught you so far and um, build up a larger project than the, the lab exercises. So the lab exercises are just going to get you um, individual concepts at a time. So just a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of learning about um, individual bits and pieces. But um, the assignment is going to have you string together a larger project. I would say that the amount of work in the assignment is roughly the same as say two or three of the complete weekly labs in a sense all chained together i mean it's hard to say because different parts of the assignment are much more difficult than other parts and there's some thinking going on in the background that you may have to do a little bit more than you would in a lab exercise where everything's sort of laid out for you but i mean that's the joy of of building up something bigger like that um are there any questions there? Ooh, Moodle is down at the moment. And someone is saying Microsoft is down and it's a worldwide thing. Oh, wow. That's tough. Oh, well. Good luck to both <laughs> Moodle and Microsoft. Um, hopefully they've got enough people on board to get their things up and running again. Uh, Jonathan's asking, when is the test? The test will be, re will be released on Thursday. And the tests will be always running Thursday to Thursday. So we'll release them on the Thursday and have them due the next Thursday. Um, I'll talk about the weekly tests a bit. I actually have a slide in the lectures to remind me that I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about after the break. <clears throat> okay, so let's get going. What did we look at last week? Oh, no. Jack saying, did anyone notice the bad grammar in the live stream link 29? I reckon I probably have um, edited that 
from another link to make sure that the date was exactly the same format and it took over the format from at some point where I said something was the second. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure you understand what it means because you're here now on the 29th. <laughs> um, okay, so last week we looked at if statements, so we, we continued our work on if statements. I don't think we introduced them last week, I think that was week one when we introduced them. But we continued our, our work on branching codes. We did some if statements, else statements. Um, we did our more complicated dice checker example where we looked at a whole lot of stuff like problem solving. Um, so we looked at the fact that with programming, because programming is so expressive, because pro programming gives us um, a lot of options with how we want to write our code. You may have noticed this if you started working with other people in labs, um, is seeing how different our code could look from each other's and still produce the same kind of result. Um, that we're always going to have many different options to solving problems, which gives us an interesting situation to be in where we need to think about um, which one of these problem solving situations we're going to decide on. Um, so we looked at, I think, four or five different ways to potentially solve a problem of um, user input not being inside the range of the integers we want. And that's a really, really kind of narrowed down problem. That doesn't even solve the problem of what if users input something that's just flat out incorrect? So there's even more possibilities there um, that we could be getting into. So, but I did want to make sure the example just focused on one thing at a time. Um, you're going to see many, many more things like this as you go along uh, and have to make a lot of interesting decisions about what you want to do uh, in terms of um, uh, in solving the problems that you have. And hopefully what we're going to do in 1511 is put a whole series of problems in front of you that test particular techniques that you're looking at, but also give you some pause and, and make you think of, okay, how do I actually get around these particular problems? And by the end of the course, um, you should be in a situation where you've seen lots of, a, a, a big variety of, of different problems to solve and hopefully have some ideas how you would approach problems in general in the future. Um, the, I'm just looking at what people are asking there. Oh, it looks like Tom and Shrey are hanging around now, so I'll let them answer most of the questions in chat while I'm talking. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is while loops. So we, um, up until that point, could never run the same code multiple times. And so that meant that if we wanted to do repetitive actions, that would mean something like copy pasting the same code multiple times. And if you've tried that, you may have noticed how cumbersome that can be um, and how super, super annoying that can be if you want to change what happens in the code that repeats because you can't really change. Well, I mean, you can, but you have to go through every time you've pasted it and, and change each one separately, which is super, super annoying. Um, but instead, we've got while loops where we have one piece of code that can run multiple times, which means if we make any changes inside the loop, it means that every time it runs, it, um, it, it takes on those changes. So it makes it much easier for us to kind of maintain our code and keep it working or fix errors in our code without having to fix it in more than one place at a time. Um, do a quick recap on, on looping as well. and what are some of the important things we need to know about when we're writing loops. So today, what are we looking at? So one thing that we're looking at today, now that we've seen enough code um, to be able to write code, um, you haven't just seen enough code now to be able to write some, some basic programs. Um, you've also seen enough code now to be able to write some really, really bad programs <laughs> if it comes down to it. So it's quite possible to, to now use your newfound skills uh, to write code that no one can understand. Um, and you may be feeling this yourself, so anyone who hasn't done any programming before, we're only two weeks in, so uh, it's not that bad if you're writing stuff and you don't even understand it yet, but what we're going to try to do is uh, give you some help on how to, um, how to write code so that it's easier for you to spot your own mistakes in it. Um, it's easier for you to show it to someone else and have them understand it and things like that. And when it comes down to it professionally, once we continue on and if we start writing code professionally, it helps you to write code that, um, that you can work really easily with other people on. 
Um, so that's going to be code style. And we're also going to look at code reviews. And this is a section that's not really just on the technical thing about code reviews, which is us specifically going through a process and looking at each other's code. We're also going to look a little bit about how we can work with other people right in the moment. So not just like we're working with people and occasionally we look at each other's code, um, but um, how we can work with people right then and there on the spot. So we can have more than one person looking at code at the same time while you're working on it. Um, a lot of our labs are designed with that possibility in mind. So I'm going to give you some techniques that you can try out in your labs. Um, so after the toots finished and you go into your labs and maybe you're in breakout rooms and stuff like that, um, uh, how we can actually uh, have a way that we can have, say, two or multiple people programming one, um, one lab exercise together. And I should note that um, we accept submissions in lab exercises that are made by multiple people. We actually encourage that you, at least some of the time, work on your code right there in the presence of someone else so that you can actually discuss it while you're doing it in a team, in a sense. Um... Okay. Uh, oh, also, we are going to introduce... I'm not actually going to go too deep into that because most of this lecture is actually about code style and code reviews, but we're introduce, going to introduce functions. We've already actually seen functions to a certain extent, um, but we haven't looked at exactly how they work and how we might write them ourselves. Um, so I'm going to introduce the concept of functions today, but I don't think we've got time for a code demo for them. So the code demo for functions is going to be tied in with what I'm doing on Friday. Um, and we'll do, we'll do some functions in code on Friday. So a bit of a recap on while loops. So what have we learned so far about while loops? They have a specific syntax of how they're written, which is really, really similar to, um, uh, to the if statements that we're doing before. We've got normal brackets, uh, and in that is going to be a question, and then we've got curly brackets where there is a body of code. Uh, so what happens is um, you ask the question, if it's true, you run what's inside the curly brackets and you go back to the question again and you ask it again. And so that way we will keep running the same code while, that's the keyword, while the question is true. One thing to remember, whenever you're, um, whenever you're making a loop, one of the most important things to do when you create a loop is to make sure you know how it's going to end. Uh, if you don't know how a loop is going to stop, you run the risk of potentially having a loop that runs forever. And we saw what happened last week uh, when we did that in code. Uh, a reminder for everyone uh, in case you need it, if you ever have a runaway program that's, that's running and, and doesn't end and you can't stop it, um, in most terminals that you're using, I think nearly all Linux terminals, if you press Control c it will cancel the program at that point. Um, if you're using DCC to compile your programs, which um, I think most of us will be using, um, at that point, DCC will tell you where your program was up to. So it'll be able to say to you, this is where I stopped, um, this is the line I was up to in my code, and that gives you a little bit of information so that you can say, if this thing was going forever, this is the point at which it was um, either stuck or inside of. So you can say, we're inside this particular loop uh, and it appears to have been going forever, so let's have a look and see if that loop itself uh, is the one that wasn't stopping. Yeah, people are discussing that there. <laughs> yeah, and to as Tom's saying, everyone should be using DCC. It's, there are other compilers, but they're a little bit dangerous to use. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know, what did I say last time? It's like driving a car without a seatbelt. It's much easier to do it with the seatbelt. It doesn't really hurt you at all. Um, you could think of it like training wheels, except the, the funny thing about if we, can, if we looked at DCC and we said it's like having training wheels on a bike, that's nearly like saying that you would eventually want to take them off. Um, but we've had some really, really funny responses from people in the computing industry asking about uh, DCC and asking whether they can actually get that to, to use as a normal uh, <laughs> industrial program. So I don't think it's even training wheels. I think it's more like a seatbelt. Um, people asking about Max, 
Tom or Shrey, do you work on Macs? I actually worked on a Mac for years, and I can't remember now what I used for Control C. So it's either Command C or it's actually Control C, because I think there is a Control, right? Anyway. Um, okay, so loops are about knowing when they stop so that you know exactly how how either exactly how many times it's going for or what condition the loop's going to end on. So some sample code here. These are the simpler examples. If you want the more complex examples of looping, uh, head back to last week's looping lecture where we, we, we went a fair bit deeper than this. So we didn't just do this single loop, but we also did some double loops. We put one of these inside another of the same kind. So there's a lot of kind of continuing ramifications of this structure that we've looked into. Having said that, the basics of what we need to understand is just here. If we want a loop to run an exact number of times, we start counting, usually at zero, but that's not 100% the case. There's no, there's nothing that says we have to go from zero up until just before a number. This is just a question and this is just a value. We can do lots of different things. So for example, I could say i is equal to 10, i is greater than zero, and then i minus minus, or i equals i minus one to count downwards. And so we could start at 10 and count downwards to one if we wanted to. So there's lots of different things um, that we can do with the while loops. But if we want to learn just the super, super basic one, which says I'm going to run an exact number of times, this format will, uh, will help you. Um, play around with the maths if you want to change it, play around with the target number if you want to, to change it. Um, as you know, code allows you to do that kind of thing. Um, Inside the curly brackets here is everything that's going to run that's going to be repeated. Another thing that's nice about the zero to a number is you know that the i inside this part of the body of the code is always going to tell you how many times the, the loop has run previously. So sometimes that's useful. Another way that we were doing it, let me just get my face out of the way of the text, um, is we could have the loop that could potentially run forever, so a loop that doesn't really have a set number of times that it runs, but it has a condition under which it will stop. And that's the only thing that it has. So we have this thing, so end loop is zero, so I'm saying don't end loop, so it starts at zero. And then I can flick this over to uh, end loop equals one when I want it to end. And then when it comes back up to this question here, it will fail this check here because this um, condition won't be true, and then we'll exit the loop. Uh, in the demo code from last week, we showed another way you can do that, where you will just simply use the numeric value of a variable in here without needing to do equals zero. So we can just use the fact that in the brackets, it's just testing whether or not one, it's, um, it's zero or another number. Um, the key code in here that we're looking at is this if statement, where we've used mod, to decide whether a number is even or not. And if it wasn't even, this variable gets switched. Yeah. So um, those are the two main styles of looping that we're going to be using a lot of the time. Um, it nearly boils down to every loop being either one of these. Um, so it's either a loop that we've set up to run a specific number of times and you don't change how many times it runs, unless maybe you change the variable um, that is the number, or you set up a specific condition where you just say, at some point we're gonna stop running this loop. So at some point we're gonna get back to the start and say, okay, that's it, that's enough times, we're not going anymore. What do we, We've got some questions here. Some people are saying Command C works. Oh yeah, they're talking about the difference between Control C and Command C on a Mac, um, but it's not necessarily the copy command we're talking about here. We're talking about the command in um, in Linux that is going to interrupt a program running um, and 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 stop it from running. Um, Kevin saying, would you say that the integer outside the loop uh, equals one is better than end loop equals zero? Um, you can go either way, Kevin. I'm not particularly saying either one because I think this is just as readable. So I could say, um, as we did in the demo last week, I could say run loop 
equals one, and then while run loop is one, we keep running, and then we can flick run, run loop to zero here. It's effectively going to be the same thing. So long as this variable is named in such a way that we can kind of process it in a human way, then we're fine. Okay, let's move on from while loops. I've spent so much effort dodging my own memes to make sure that my face isn't covering them up. So let's think about writing code for humans. Um, this is something that we generally refer to as code style. Um, you may have been introduced to a little bit of this already in the tutorials, where we've given you a program called 1511 style that actually runs on your code and looks for certain situations in your code where the style might not be working perfectly. This is only going to tell you part of what's going on because a computer program can't read your variable names and say to you, in a human context, uh, this variable name doesn't quite make sense, but a different variable name might, right? So it's just, it's just a program that reads things, but it can do stuff like indentation and things. We'll go into the details in a sec. But I want to talk about why we do this. So one of the interesting things that we're going to get to, one of the things that... Um, Regardless of how much time you've spent programming, regardless of how, how good you are at it, and how experienced you are at coding, the ratio is still roughly the same. We spend, I would say, about 15 to 20% of our time creating new code, and roughly 80% of our time trying to figure out why it doesn't work. So, <laughs> this, is, this is a running... Um, a running situation that we're going to be talking about in 1511 that we're going to be continually looking at this. So we're going to look at all the different ways we can try to make it so that we write our code in a way that um, that we don't have to fix it as much as we could. And so one of the ways we can do this is to make it easier to read. So this means that for us, while we're working on our code, there will always be mistakes in our code. We're human. Um, it would take a, a a very, very small amount of trivial code for us to just write it and say, I guarantee this is going to work without me doing any testing. Um, I don't think there's really anyone who codes who who doesn't specifically make sure they do a lot of testing at all. Someone's come to say hi. This is Chicken. She's the lecturer in charge. So she was just pointing out to me that she agrees that code style is very important, um, but she's slightly annoyed that I've got a picture of a cat that's other than her on my slides. Anyway, so if we can write our code in such a way that it's easier to spot mistakes in it, it's easier for us to understand it, or it's easier for us to have other people understand it, um, it generally leads to faster overall development time, which is quite funny because people seem to think that um, uh, going to the trouble to write really neat code takes longer than writing normal code, but even if when we look at the ratio of like yeah, 80% of your time spent fixing, 20% of your time spent writing code, if that 20% of the time gets longer, it's not that big a deal because that's actually a shorter amount of time. But the, the big long time is fixing stuff and trying to fi figure out what's wrong. Um, and if we can shorten that, then it's worth spending more time writing the code. So that's like a lot of the rationale behind um, why we would try to write our code in a way that's the most human readable possible. And now we're going to have a look at a lot of the different ways that we can do that um, and some spe specific techniques on it. Um... <laughs> Everyone's saying you should make a meme with chicken. I will, I will do that if I can. Okay, so what are some of the things, and so this is getting down to the nitty gritty of actually what you might do. What are some of the things that might um, might help you to understand your code. So one of the things we've seen a little bit, and I've introduced it, but I haven't really formalized it, is indentation and bracketing. So that's the fact that we do have curly brackets in a lot of different places. Um, we have other normal brackets in some places. And when a co piece of code is contained in um, the curly brackets, we usually indent it to make sure that we can see really clearly what's inside what. That means that without even reading any of the code, just looking at where the indentation level is, uh, we can see where we're at. 
Uh, names of variables and functions allow us to remember what something does and why it exists, uh, which means sometimes without knowing what a variable's value is or how it was created or anything like that, we still know what it does. Um, and we have constants as well, and because our constants are in all caps versus our variables that are in lowercase, we know which of our values we can change and which of our values we can only read from. I actually have slides for each of these, so I will go through it in, in more detail. Um, repetition of code. We have not yet given you a great many tools on how to reduce repetition in code. So we will be getting there. Um, in fact, I will be introducing a new one later today, uh, which is functions, which will allow you to um, um, write repeatable code in a sense. Clear comments. So we've been doing a fair bit of this and in the programs I've been writing, I've been putting comments in them. So whenever we have code that isn't necessarily immediately understandable to another programmer, it's nice to have some comments in there to explain why something happened or um, even just to abbreviate what something is doing. So you have a section of code that does something complicated and you have a comment at the top saying, this say processes the um, the user's input for the number of sides on the die and corrects any errors in their input. So you can have a line like that above a bunch of code. I think we did have a line like that above a bunch of code. And then it allows someone when they're skimming through the code to just read that line and ignore the next paragraph of code so they can say, all right, I know that, that thing does that and so I don't need to look there. Um, so anything like that that speeds up people's ability to be able to read code is quite a handy. Um, consistency as well, it's um, it's really, really difficult to read code if someone sets up sort of a convention for how they're coding. So they go, all right, my indentation, so let's say we work in a different um, a different group than COMP1511. So COMP1511 has four space indentation. So we work somewhere else that works with say three space indentation. It happens, right? Um, the four space thing is a decision. It's not something that is set in stone in the world of programming and everyone agrees that it's exactly what we're going to do. It's probably the most common way of indent indenting that exists, but I've seen people use two space, three space. Um, and historically, there used to be people who used eight space indenting, um, but I think eight space has sort of stopped being used because it's really, it's really big. Your indent is really far away and it's slightly annoying to read. So less people are using that now, but there's no, there's no guarantee that spacing is always going to be uh, a particular number. So if you start with say three space indenting and then you go to four space indenting for certain parts of your code, then back to three space indenting for other parts, it's going to be super confusing for people. It's going to be hard to read. So that kind of inconsistency can cause issues. So lots of little things like that. I'm going to teach you examples of each of these things as we go along. Having said that, before we go and launch into the details of what we should be doing, I thought it might be interesting to look at something that might, uh, it might be interesting to look at uh, that is not necessarily good code style um, and some of the examples of what the issues are that we can get when, um, when we're looking at um, code that is written badly but it's still functionally doing exactly what we want it to do. So let me just open VLab. I think I forgot to copy this one. So we're just going to have to grab the... Um... Grab the code from the class website. Um, we are in lecture five, so I'm going to make a new directory for lecture five. Go into that directory. Head over to the class web page. What are we in? Week three bad code style that we will go through during the lecture. I'm going to download that into my lecture five directory. All right, that being downloaded, I should be able to see it here. And I do let us open this and see what it looks like. All right, let me just, I think I have one more slide before we get into this. Actually, no, 
Let's let's just go straight in. Okay. Oh, actually, maybe I do want to talk about that slide. Okay, so we're about to go in and have a look at this. So the question is, what went wrong? <laughs> and this is a situation where we want to say more than saying, oh, that is a huge mess. I don't know what to do with this. Um, we want to have a look and, again, a problem-solving thing. We want to break this down into its parts and figure out what we're going to do to make it better. Um, there are lots of issues in this little piece of code, so I want to say don't panic too much just yet. Um, but what we want to do is we want to look at all the little issues that might come up in this code. So let's have a look at it here. All right, so there's a, there's a header, header comment here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Cool poor code style. This is one of my oldest examples coming going back to February 2019 when I wrote this one. Because I haven't really needed to update this code, because as you can see, it is already fulfilling its purpose. If I wanted to show you code that is nearly impossible to read, I think I may have succeeded in this. Okay. <laughs> now, this is this is probably a lot worse than um, than anything I've ever seen as working as a professional programmer. So we're not likely to see all of these problems at once um, in code. But it's nice to be able to look at a piece of code like this and try to find. The problems and say okay what are all the little issues and what can we do to make this work better so <laughs> shrey saying now imagine having to mark something like this i mean i hope that i hope that none of you will be submitting anything like this for us to mark <laughs> um i should also point out you will tend to get less marks if you write something like this because uh, if we can't read it we don't know what's working or not so let us let us point out the fact I want to point out a really important fact about this code. It runs. And apart from an Easter egg that I put in there or something where it doesn't actually work, um, it will do nearly everything that we think it's going to do. Let me just, let me let me run this. DCC code style bad. And the output file is actually dice check. So this is our dice check app. So if I run this, enter how many sides are on my dice, so it's six-sided dice, um, the value of the first die, let's say it's a four and a three, total roll is seven, the dice check was tied. So we can see from that that this actually has the code for tied, tied die rolls in it. Um, we can see from that that the target number was most likely seven, it was able to add up the four and the three and then get seven. So this is this is functional code, uh, which is which is really probably one of the biggest problems about this code is because it's functioning, um, we might be tempted to accept it and get it to work. <laughs> Mega Grog is like, this is dice check. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's look through this, and knowing what we know so far about programming and things that we might want to do with it, um, I'm going to open this up to chat. Let us know, let me know what things you can see in this that you think might be an issue that we might want to change in order to make this more readable. And so I will go through chat and see what people are saying, and then I'll fix up a few of them if we can. Okay, Rosie's saying constants should be defined in caps and underscores. Yeah, so we've got a double problem here, which is really funny. Constant seven. <laughs> just like constant i know it's a constant we have to find of course it's a constant but what are we what are we naming it right so we've got a variable naming issue here and the variable naming issue runs through the whole bit of code because we've got all of these variables here these a x a b and y they're not even in x y and a and b they're not even laid out in a way that we can understand but we have we have these variables and we want to do something with it so i think that this is a target value so if I just change that to target, and I'm going to press here Control F, which is for find, and I'm going to look up the word constant in my code, and change these constants to that target that I've just created. 
there is a way of doing a global find and replace of your code, but it's often a little bit scary to do that because if you try to do a global find and replace, you might replace more things than you're intending. So often I will just search through a bit at a time. Okay. <laughs> Jamie says, complete and utter lack of indentation. So let's look at all of our indentation and see where the issues are. So the very beginning here, we've opened a curly brackets, which means we should have indentation inside. So that's a four space indent. There's a three space indent here, which is messy. So I'll turn that into a four space. I'll bring this one back. This one also should be indented. Um, this opening bracket and close brackets there, which means these two lines should be indented in. We're not even seeing some of the problems because they're all the way over here that we have more than one thing per line. But we'll see what else everyone's got. Um, comments. Daniel says the comments. How good is this comment? This bit does the dice thing. Okay. Thanks. It's useful, the dice thing. The other thing, the other interesting comment is there's nothing in here about what this code is. So when I said this is dice check, everyone was like, what? This is dice check? It's like, yeah. Um, also, we should look at these variable names because there's something up here. Like, which one of these are values? Which one of these is a total? Which one of these is the number of sides on the dice? I don't even know. I don't even know. Wait. Please enter how many dice are on your die, uh, how many sides are on your dice, and then we scan X. So X is, I think, size of the dice. But anyway, let's go. Okay, so we're talking about comments there. <laughs> Numbits and everything. <laughs> Not everything. Code functions. Hmm. <laughs> Um, Kevin's saying the variables are not understandable to human beings. I would 100% agree with that. Some random guy says, you should just restart the whole thing. It would conceivably um, take less time to write this from scratch than it would to fix everything in here. Having said that, I still want to look at this because unless we've seen something, an example of how bad things can be, um, it's, uh, it's something we still need to look at. Um, so Shai says, fix your enter key. Yes. So... It is technically fine for C to have multiple things in the same... I'm going to change the spacing here as well to make it more readable. To have multiple uh, things on the same line. We could even, if we want to, declare integers like this. And say, I'm declaring multiple integers at once. My computer will just deal with the fact that I want multiples of these. So you can do that if you want to. Um, but... Sometimes it's easier because we tend to read vertically. If these were longer and they went further along, wait, from your perspective, further along the screen there, we'd end up missing some of these. Like we'd end up not seeing things. Like this scanf here is, is the perfect example of I'm reading vertically and I think we're only printing, um, not realizing that there's a hidden command over here on the end. The general rule is one command per line. Uh, when there's one command per line, then we can scan up and down. We don't have to like read across every single line to see what's happening. So I might be tempted to do something like this, just for layout. We haven't even hit the variable names and changing them yet, but we should probably do that. Um, let's start with this one. So X we think is the, the size of the dice. So I'm gonna say dice size. I'm gonna control F looking for X. Go on here. There's going to be a few of these. I'm tempted to do a, um, I think it's Control H to find and replace all of the X's with um, with dice size. But the the problem we might get is you see we're finding X's here, <laughs> and there might be X's in other things. So it's pretty dangerous to search for X and replace it with a word. Um, so I might not necessarily do that. But rely on the fact that it's been highlighted here. I should have picked one that wasn't going to take me through the whole... Hang on. I'm going to copy that. And then just paste it over these. Note that, oh, look at that, look at that, because I went over this bar and I wasn't looking at it. There was one hiding. 
<laughs> uh, lots and lots of little issues in this. No, I don't want to replace that one. Okay. So now I know where my dice size is being used in a few of these places. Um, caps are constants. I think we've got that one that we looked at. Uh, the tie value name at seven, it might be a better name for the constant to actually have the number. Yeah, sometimes it is good to have it as a number, but sometimes if you're going to change this target number, um, you may not want to give it a number. So say someone does a different check and the target becomes nine or ten or something. We don't want to have that called seven if the value can change to nine or ten. Um, say if we want to rerun it for a different purpose. Okay. Um... Eric's saying those are some long lines, and we have identified some of these long lines of problems. Um... <laughs> Asama says control A and backspace. So control A selects all. <laughs> so that, what we're saying is control A and backspace. <laughs> okay, I'm going to control Z that, because we still want to look at this code. Um... Oh, and someone's saying VS Code has a replace within feature, which would be kind of handy. Um, what else are we looking at? There was um, excess indentation. Oh, there was this this indent this gap here for no particular reason. Um, Rosie's saying the binary operator needs a less than on either side. I would definitely do that as well. This is much more readable. Um, than having it all clumped together. And then we've got these weird ones where there's just one space missing. And here, like that really, this one's particularly bad. It looks like this is a symbol for something. And I'm looking at it just going, that's not that's not code. Is there a percent something that changes where a variable works or something? I don't, I don't even know. So um, that makes it look like this is one symbol as opposed to having a space there where it's really clear this, this, and this are three different symbols that make up um, some code. Okay, so lots and lots of little things there. Um, uh, Gotham saying, would it be better to have the int variables on different lines? It makes it easier to read, definitely, if these are on different lines. Uh, Rubyet was asking, how do we name all constants in the code to target at once? If we wanted to do something like that, so let's say um, I want to rename all targets to something different, I can do control H here, or we can do in search here and replace. And what we do is we can take target and let's say I just wanted to be really specific about it and call it target value. I could say replace all, and then it would say target value target value and target value. Just be sure when you're doing that, that your that word isn't appearing somewhere else. Um, there's different ways that you can make sure that works. Um, but yeah, a replace all like that can do it. David is saying, maybe let's just put an enter after every semicolon so we can actually read this. That's a good rule. Um, I would be happy to use that rule because the semicolon is where the C compiler, DCC, is going to put its own kind of idea of an enter key. It's going to say, you finished saying something every time there's a semicolon. So it's good for us as humans to see that we finished saying something every time there's a semicolon. So here, I mean, like, starting an if statement halfway through a line is just scary. So yeah, we can start putting enter keys at the end of these. Um, also to move this bracket down and then we can start to think about where this bracket should be. Okay, so we've gone through um, a lot of these issues. Um, I'll see what else people are saying. Jonathan's saying, is it possible to have the co whole code on one line? Yes. And it's nearly, when you think about it, the only reason why this is on multiple lines is because this particular character, the new line character, for us as humans, changes the way this thing looks. In memory on our computer, it's a whole string of ones and zeros. They're just in a row. And some of those happen to be this new line character, which for humans moves it down to the next line, but for the computer, the computer doesn't care. Technically, the whole file is just on one line, but it's got a few of these new lines in amongst it, and it's got these spaces. But the computer sees them all just as characters. So these are the ways that we're going to change things to make it work for us. Okay. Um, 
Someone says, I think Shrey told us we could. <laughs> They're singling you out, Shrey. Um, okay. Uh, Anthony's asking an interesting question. When is it okay to define a variable as a single alphabetic character um, versus giving it something more specific? Um, there are certain conventions that we will use a lot. So often the, the looping um, variable, so the iterator that we call it, that goes through a loop. So when we have the something equals zero and it goes up to less than something, uh, i is a variable that we use for that. And um, it's, it's a fairly commonly used thing to have i equals zero, i counts upwards. And then if you have a loop inside that, j equals zero and j counts upwards. So that's a common thing that's used. When we're looking at coordinate systems, like a two-dimensional grid, using x and y is acceptable as well because we as humans who have done a bit of mathematics and stuff like that tend to accept those things. Um, and I think Shrey's answering a lot of those questions there. Okay, okay. All right. I'm going to move on because there's other stuff we need to talk about. But we got a lot of good information out of everyone there. Everyone's saying, okay, here are a lot of the issues that we have with this code. Um, secret for everyone to look at. There is something in this code that does not work. So there's actually an error in this code that makes the program sometimes not run the way it's supposed to run. Um, and it's interesting to, to figure out when you can find out when that error is. So could you find that error in the code file as it was um, before we started cleaning it up? Or did you have to significantly clean up the code before you could see what the error was? I've had actually had one student, um, I think it was like at least six months ago, who actually picked the error before it, before it came up. But I'll let you play around with it and see what you can find. In the meantime, Let's go back to this idea. Okay, in the face of disaster, keep a clear head, right? So we want to say that, yes, there's a lot of issues here, but then there's also how do we actually pick at individual parts of this? Rather than saying delete everything, what if the functionality in this code was something that we needed? Or the functionality in this code was something that was actually running in a deployed professional system. And what we were there to do is to make sure this code was modifiable. We would have to go through and try to clean up all that style. Let's have a look at some of the things that happened and see if we caught all of those. Header comments doesn't show the program's intentions. Yeah, we didn't get that. Um, oh, actually, you know the one thing about comments? This is a best, this is a great one here. Uh, this comment says, can't remember why, but don't delete this next line. I have seen that comment. So I've seen that comment in code that was running. <laughs> So code that had been deployed professionally and it had that comment in it. So it's it's pretty funny to see that, but neither of these comments are useful. They're not explaining what's happening. Um, and neither is this. I mean, this one is kind of, because this is the not part of the bad code. But even, even so, the header doesn't tell us that this is dice check or what its intention is or anything. So it's really hard to understand what's going on. Um, there are no blank lines separating different components, so we didn't even get to that level of detail. I think that the code would need to have been cleaned up a bit more for us to be able to see that. But you know how we think of paragraphing code? I like say this is code that takes input, then this is code that adds up the total, this is the code that then checks the total um, against the target value. Having a space, uh, a, a, um, a line of white space in between each of those can help. The multiple expressions on the same line, we found that one. Inconsistent indenting. I'm pretty sure that was easy to spot. Um, oh, people are talking about potentially using um, VS Code. So VS Code is another text editor um, that we can use for, um, for coding. We're not necessarily using VS Code as the standard in the course, um, just because I prefer using gedit because it's it's much simpler and doesn't have any bells and whistles on. So I think it's easier to to work with if you've never seen anything before. But if you want to use VS Code, there's no problem with doing that. Um, OK, so other things, the variable names didn't make sense. We definitely saw that one. Comments not meaning anything, we saw that one. Ooh, inconsistent bracketing of if statements. We didn't even look closely enough to see that. There are some if statements in this that aren't bracketed, which is pretty scary. 
Um, the bracketing wasn't indented, yes, we saw that. Inconsistent structure of identical code blocks. I think also we would have to clean this up a bit more to be able to see that. So there were actually, there's the dice check, I think there's the input invalid input checking for both dice and it's not the same code it's actually laid out completely differently between the two um, so that inconsistency makes those two kind of um, valid input checks look very different from each other so lots of little fiddly bits in there um, some of these things you will see if you try to clean up the code more some of it is blindingly obvious just from looking at it but either way we've picked up a lot of the issues here which is handy so keeping your house clean so this is something that i was taught and i'm just gonna try to cover up the background so you can't see my actual apartment i mean it's not it's not messy it's just that i don't have a lot of space so so there's just stuff everywhere um but something that i was taught is that it's much much easier to keep something clean by cleaning as you go than it is to try to do a cleanup after everything is messy. So the difference between, and this is exactly what people are saying, and they say, why don't you just write this thing from scratch? Because if you wrote it from scratch, you could put the cleanliness into it line by line, rather than trying to rebuild something that's, that's clean code afterwards. So a couple of things that we can do while we're making our code, which is gonna make it easier for us to um, to make it work. So the, one of the first things is we can write the comments before writing the code. Because one of the things that makes that really nice is if we write the comments, then we write the code for them. We know at the title of each paragraph of code what it was for. Uh, it actually makes it easier for us to write the rest of the code. Um, naming variables before we use them. I mean, it should be basically impossible to, to, to use a variable without naming it. But this is a matter of like trying to name things correctly <laughs> before we use them. When we open brackets, let's indent everything, four spaces. And this is not, as I said, not an absolute. Four spaces in comp 1511 might not be four spaces in everything that you ever do. We line up the closing brackets vertically with the line that opened it. So that way, if, we, if we're scanning up and down, we can see really clearly where the open and close brackets are. Um, this one's not actually a hard and fast rule. It is in 1511 with our style but there's another bracketing style that people use. Um, I'll show you that at some point. Um, um, that's equally useful. It has, its, it has its pros and cons. Everywhere you go that you're going to write code is likely to have something like a style guide. Uh, we've got a style guide on the website. They are going to show you how this particular organization or group of people uh, likes to code. Um, and we'll all be expected whenever we're working with people to follow their style guide. The last thing we want to do is follow our own style guide with someone else's code and then end up making it inconsistent. It's better for something to be inconsistent than for something to be my style being the only style that everyone should use. We don't really want to get to that point, right? Um, because there's pros and cons of every different kind of style. If you're going to try to convince someone to use a different style, with what they're doing, then what you're trying to do then is convince them to change everything in a particular organization, which is possible, but difficult. Okay, uh, one expression per line is something that we saw, like every time you put a semicolon, you can press enter, it's probably going to be fine. Um, and consistency and spacing between things so we don't have operators looking like they're attached to variables. Some examples of this in the next few slides this is what I was talking about. You can plan ahead with your comments. So for example here, me looking at um, the idea of a success, a tie, and a failure. So this was the one of the challenges I gave you at the very beginning. Um, I can write the comments in here saying, these are the things that I wanna put inside these if statements. And then after that, I can fill these out to make sure they line up with the thing that they're going to be. And I can say this paragraph is checking against a target value that will remind me that I'm checking the total against the target in each of these if statements. So this kind of thing, simple to get started with. When code gets really complicated, this 
this kind of technique can really, really help you because it can really, really help you because it separates two forms of thinking. One is thinking about how to solve the problem and the other is thinking about how to write C code. And they're two completely different things. One of them is all syntax and grammar and the other is like logical thinking. So if you can separate the two of them and do them, do them, do one of them before you do the other, then you don't confuse yourself by trying to do them both at the same time. So this isn't just making it more readable. Uh, this is actually making it easier to write. Um, naming variables. Two things that I like to think about when we're naming variables is what is that variable going to be used for? Um, how do we distinguish that variable from the other variables in the program? Those are the two things that I like to think about when I'm naming a variable. Um, so can we describe what it is? Um, if someone else was going to read it, would they agree that that made sense for what it was going to be? Um, not everyone has lab partners, but I, I encourage you to work with other people in labs. We're going to talk about this later, actually, about code reviews and things. Um, and does it distinguish, does the name distinguish itself against the other variables in the program? So if you have one called, say, loop counter or something like that, and then you've got three different loops in the program, you want to be careful about what that actually means. Uh, indentation here. And I think we've gone over this a little bit so everyone sort of knows. If I open a curly brackets, everything inside has four spaces of indentation, at least four spaces of indentation. It might end up with more because there's more opening brackets and it gets indented further. So without knowing what this code is, and even with the comments, follow the same indentation rules with the comments. You don't want a comment being outside of your, even though the comment's not going to be read by the compiler or anything, if the comment is not indented properly, it's going to make it look like something's not inside something else. So you can see here pretty clearly we indent inwards as something's inside something. The bracket that closes a line, so this is the opening bracket, this is the closing bracket. I didn't even count the brackets to know that that was true. I do this because I know that this will all be empty space until the bracket that closes it. So if I want to see a section of code, I should be able to scan it vertically. This also, this is the line that open brackets. It should be empty space underneath it until I see a closing bracket. And then I know exactly what my sections of code are. Um, this is one of the most fundamental things about code style so that we know um, what is inside of what. Because if not, we don't know what actually is and isn't running from this if statement. <laughs> exhibit, exhibit A, this if statement which code is inside this if statement. I don't know. The only reason I know is because gedit was nice enough to highlight where the closing bracket was. Um, I have some indentation here, which actually looks like it's correct, the indentation. But I still wasn't sure where it was because I couldn't just scan downwards and look for the closing bracket. I can't let this go without. Actually, I don't even know if that's the correct level of indentation. That definitely feels wrong. Having an if statement on the far left, that feels wrong because if statements have to be inside another body of code, which is the main there. So I think that that's like that. I don't know. It's so messy, it's hard to say. Um, there's also something going off the end here that I can't read that I'm sure is something important. Anyway, I'm not going to go too deep into that one. <laughs> okay, one expression per line. Uh, and this is something that we saw in that is that the more expressions that you have with the semicolons per line, the more likelihood you are going to have of not knowing exactly how many things are happening. If you get one per line, it's really easy to scan downwards and say how many things uh, are happening. But if they go across, you're like, how many operations are in this? It's easy to count these, but these ones, it's like, oh, there's a few here. And I'm not sure, okay, there's two there and two there. But this line's longer than that one that could have looked like three, and it's like it can get really messy. Um, spacing, spacing things out vertically means you know exactly how many things are happening, and you know by looking just at the start of each line roughly what that line is going to be. So at the start of this line, I can say we're declaring a variable. I didn't know what was happening later on in the line. This one in particular, I'm setting a variable to a value, um, and then I'm doing some um, some modification of those variables. But if I'm scanning downwards, it doesn't really look like that to me, whereas this one's really clear. Um, spacing, we had a quick look at this as well. Um, this is very difficult to read. Um, because there's no space between the operators, it's like 
is B and and something connected together or is this, you know, as it's really hard to tell for sure. Like it nearly looks like this section here, B and and B inside these angle is inside these angle brackets and it's its own component or something like that. As opposed to here where it's where we can see more clearly the variables are separated from the operators. Um, so it's a little bit easier to read like that. Um, there's some questions there. Jonathan's saying, shouldn't the curly bracket be on another line? Um, I think that maybe this was the previous thing. Was it these ones? Here? Or that one? I'm not sure exactly which question you're asking about, Jonathan, but potentially, depending on which one of these things uh, we were looking at, there, there probably was a case where the curly bracket could have been somewhere else. Um, before that, this one. I think this one's okay. Anyway, sorry. I think I've I think I've already jumped past your question. I apologize, but I have to keep going with the lecture. Okay, so we've gone through our spacing. Um, if you want more information about coding style. So here, those were some of the simple things. And so some of these things are things that you could consider rules if you want to. So if you want to, if you want to look at it like just do this all the time, you could definitely get away with following these few things here as rules for what to do. Um, if you want to look at more subtleties of coding style, we have a style guide on the course webpage. Um, it is just one style guide. I don't want to say that this is the only way to write code because it definitely isn't the only way to write code. And every now and then I will probably do some code in lectures where I say, okay, now we're going to do this in a slightly different style and I'll show you other coding styles. Um, I don't have an exact preference for coding style. I um, have coded different ways in different organizations and I'm happy to just kind of follow whatever's necessary. When it comes down to it, as so long as the code is readable and consistent, that's the important thing. That's why we have code style. However, consistency is also important. So I'll follow whatever style is currently being used um, in, a, in a particular organization. Um, so we will get arguments over whether uh, uh, different ways of splitting words up in variable names are. So some people use this thing called camel case, where you have a capital letter at the start of every word. Other people use snake case, where you put underscores in the variables. Um, I'm happy to go either way. I do camel case on instinct, but I will make sure I do a few demo programs with snake case to show you the difference. It's not super important. It's like Xbox versus PlayStation. Um, I'll buy whichever one has the games that I want to play on and I'm not really tied particularly to one or the other. But I know that some people like to pick a camp and, and fight unnecessarily hard for it. Um, I'm trying to tell you that when we're programming, we don't have camps. We, we're going to have to move between things as... Um, uh, as needs must. Okay, so we will be marking you on style, so we'll be giving you some feedback on what is and isn't good style um, in the assignments, uh, but also we'll be doing some things called code reviews in the tutorials to let you know about different ways to write code and different ways we can look at other people's code. Um, the exam has some style marks. It hasn't, doesn't have that as much style marks as the assignments, because we're not going to, um, we don't have as much time when we're marking exams to give you clear feedback on things. Um, the assignments are marked by your tutors and so they will give you clear feedback on style and be able to have a conversation with you in the labs about it as well. So it's much better for us to do, um, do our work on style in, in assignments and um, in labs. Okay, pretty sure that's it for the first half of the lecture. So a little bit about um, code style, as you can see already, because I'm not sure if everyone um, was able to find the error in in the, the bad code style that I had there. I don't think anyone said, wait, Alex D figured it out. Yep. There is, there is an error in the the valid input checking, I think, of the second die roll, where I think that the second die is checking the validity of the first die again rather than the second die. I think you figured it out. Well done, Alex. I'd be interested to see how much 
of the um, how much the code you had to clean up before that became apparent. Usually for most people, it's like, yeah, I had I had to spend like at least twenty minutes like changing variable names, changing indentation and stuff before I could actually figure out what was happening. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go on break. It's twelve o four now, so we'll come back at five in five minutes, twelve o nine. And we'll continue with the lecture.
And we're back. <laughs> I have a feeling the Among Us game will barely have gotten started by that time <laughs> I start off again. I was thinking about the hilarity of um, doing something like um, lecture content or something like that inside a computer game. Like trying to find a game where it's free for everyone to get there and then actually just bring everyone in and um, and being in the um, in the stream while we're in game, like something like having a lecture in World of Warcraft where we all get together and there's like I don't know how many people there would be like hundreds of people all in the same space at the same time and in this kind of physical space while someone's talking. Um, I thought that would be really cool. Or even if I um, I don't know because I don't know how many people have Nintendos, but like me building a big like amphitheater lecture theater thing in um in animal crossing and um and then having everyone come and visit my island and then come in for the lecture i think it'd be really funny because it would be like funny because you'd all come to my island and then afterwards i'd just be like where are all my trees who took all my trees <laughs> or something like that when we finish up uh josh is asking what does what does this mean this is an old t-shirt that i got i got given by where is that company called? Atlassian. Um, I, I think Atlassian are the biggest Australian uh, tech company, so a lot of people here will probably know who they are. Um, and it's uh, the the slash in these brackets here in certain coding formats is a finishing tag, so it's a tag that completes a section of something, so it is you complete me, which is cute. I prefer to say, whenever I'm wearing this t-shirt, I say it's you slash me, which is funnier and sillier. Anyway, okay, um, yeah, Miguel is saying use redstone in Minecraft. Like, we could teach, if we wanted to, we could teach an entire programming course using Minecraft blocks. The only downside is it's not that useful to you if you want to continue on as a professional programmer. It would be quite useful to learn about logic. Uh, uh, the logic of programming by doing that, but if we do it with C as well, we can br we bring you closer to actually being useful with it. Um, okay, so let's continue. So, oh yes, I wanted to, this is why I have this slide here, because by the time I get to the middle of the lecture, I tend to forget what I was talking about. So, I want to talk a little bit about weekly tests, because the first one is coming uh, on Thursday. So the weekly test is a series of questions um, I think all of our weekly tests are three questions, and the way those three questions are laid out is one's quite easy, one is, I guess, core knowledge, and the other one is reasonably hard. So the way that you can do this is you run a mini exam for yourself. We're not going to invigilate this or anything like that, but you run for exactly one hour. Um, and if you time it for yourself and you, you happen to not have any distractions for that one hour, um, at the end of the hour you can say, all right, I'm going to stop now, and you can run it like an exam. It's actually very good to run this like an exam. Don't look anything up, uh, don't use Google for anything, don't have the lecture slides open or anything like that, just try to do it from what you know. Um, and at the end of the hour you can say, okay, there's some stuff I know and there's some stuff I don't know. Um, and then you can write down for yourself, these are the things I want to study further, and these are the things that I'm pretty sure of. Um, so if you're getting two questions right, then you're pretty solid. Uh, if you're getting one question right, then you know there's some things that you need to look at. If you're getting zero questions right, then it's like, okay, we need to go back and definitely go over these things. If you're getting three questions right, then you're saying, okay, I, at the moment, from where I'm looking, I'm not looking at a pass, I might be looking at one of the marks higher than a pass in the course. So um, that's that kind of thing where you can you can test yourself and you know where you're up to. And it's really important to know where you're up to when you're learning stuff so you know how much more you want to learn or how much you, um, you think you can um, sort of go, okay, that knowledge is fine. I've got that stuff. Let's move on to something new. Uh, the other thing, though, is we want to uh, give you a chance to, to figure out what it is you do and don't know. So we're happy for you after you finish that one hour and had a good kind of reflection on how things are going, um, you can then continue working on it. So we're happy for people to submit things that have all three questions completed 
uh, even if you didn't complete them all in the first hour. Because it's not really, like, the mark isn't about how successful you are. The mark is just there to make sure you do it so that you get this kind of continual feedback on how you're going in the course. Um, I think that's everything that I wanted to say about... Oh, the other thing that I want to say is please don't spoil it. Um, these tests only work if you don't know what the questions are beforehand. If you do know what the questions are beforehand, then that one hour is kind of wasted because you've already had time in your brain to think about it beforehand. So you don't, um, uh, you don't necessarily get the proper test out of it. So we're getting um, a couple of uh, questions here about them. Um, weekly tests count towards the final mark. Yes, the weekly tests do count towards the final mark. Um, not very much. I think it's 5% total. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not necessarily um, important how well you do in them. It's just important that you do them. Like any attempt at them already gets you 50% of the marks. Um, um, yeah, and you can count... Oh yeah, and someone's asking, do we only get graded if we do it in under an hour? No, you get graded for a week's worth. If you want to, you can spend the whole week working on it. So if after the first hour you feel like things aren't working and you really, really want to go over it in detail, I encourage you to go over it in detail afterwards and figure out exactly what you do and don't know about these things and learn some things and then hand it in and go for it. Because it's, it's reasonably conceivable that everyone will get 100% in the weekly tests. It's not necessarily the case, but it's reasonable that people could do that if they wanted to, because it's less questions than in the labs. Um, they tend to be smaller questions in the labs as well. They're actually closer to the kinds of questions that we ask in the exam, some of them. Um, uh, and there's plenty of time to do them if you want. Uh, so that's the way that you can do it. Um, they're pretty good practice for high pressure situations. So if you do do them in exactly an hour, it's the same kind of pressure you might be under if you're um, doing an exam. Or exams are even more pressured sometimes. Uh, or job interviews where you're expected to show your coding ability right then and there, uh, working with someone rather than um, uh, rather than necessarily being given the time to go Google things and look things up and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Raman's asking, is the final exam similar to that of the weekly tests or not at all? Um, it's similar. A lot of the questions are going to be similar, but the exam is going to have its own format. I actually have an entire lecture going over the exam later in term, but for now I'm not going to talk about the exam because like, I don't think we know enough content yet to start talking about the exam. Okay, so that's that's just a bit on weekly tests. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, I think Tom can answer those questions there while I go on to the rest of the content. So I wanted to talk about this thing called a code review. Um, a code review is something that we would often do uh, in, 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 in an industry setting where we would actually um, finish a section of code, take it to a group of other people, have them look over it and have them give us feedback on it. So this is about discussing your code with other people. So what we might do is go into a room with a projector and I will put my code up on the projector and I'll say, okay, this is my attempt to do this and this and this. Here are some of the issues I had in what I was doing. Um, here are the points that I think I'm not sure about and I need people to look at these sections. And then people might say, what does that section there do? And I'll say, oh, that's interesting that you don't quite see what's going on there because I know exactly what's going on there because I wrote it, but maybe I haven't written it in such a way that people understand it. Let me put some comments in there to talk about it. And someone else can say, okay, that bit that you're having a problem with there that you were talking about, I have this other technique that we can use that might be able to do that in a way that works for you. It'll be, oh, that's really interesting. And then we'll start writing code maybe, and we'll look, we'll look at it and we'll say, oh, okay, here are the other ways to do this. So they're really useful in terms of um, understanding how well other people can read our code, how well other people can understand our code, and that way we can rewrite it to be more understandable. The other thing we can do is we can group think problem solving, and so we can, we can get a group of people to look at our problems with us. And someone who's reviewing my code might look at my code and say, that's really nifty, that thing that you did there. I've never thought of doing that before, I'm gonna use that. 
Or they can do the opposite, where they can say, have you thought of doing this? And I can say, wow, that's going to solve all of this stuff that I'm doing here in a really easy way. So it's this kind of way where getting human eyes on your code can sometimes be really valuable in comparison to um, getting um, um, just getting your computer to be the only thing that reads your code. So a couple of things that we're going to do this for. Um, one of the reasons I put my code up for review whenever I'm doing it is to make sure that other people can understand it. Um, one of the, the sort of pitfalls that we get a lot of the time in programming is the longer that we've been working on a single piece of code, the more we know it and the more we don't realize what other people don't know about it. So it's really, really nice to get other people to look at it. And, and with a fresh set of eyes, you can get new solutions to problems. And you can also just highlight um, what is and isn't working in your code. Um, when you're looking at someone else's code as the reviewer, it's really, really interesting to see how other people write code. So you might see the way person, uh, someone's doing something and just go, wow, their style is really nice. I can read their code better than I can read my own because of the way that they're, they're doing their style. Can I maybe have a longer conversation with them later about how what their process is, about how they go about putting together this style? Or can I say to them, um, that was a really interesting way that you did that looping there. I have not done it like that. Can you show me how that works so that I can use it in my other programs and things? And I encourage you to do stuff like this in labs. Um, looking at each other's code in the labs is totally fine. It's totally doable. Um, I mean, it's really nearly to the point where the labs were written with the intention that multiple people would see each other's lab exercises and talk about them and things. Because I think you're actually going to learn a lot from teaching each other about the way you're writing code in those situations. Just be careful because we do have pretty strict plagiarism policies at UNSW about any kind of collaboration on assignments and weekly tests. But the labs are open and we want you to, because we do want you to learn how to discuss things. Um, when you're working on code out there in the wild, uh, generally you won't be alone. Um, so it's very good to be able to work with other people. Um, some other little questions there. Oh, Paco is asking, are there past exam questions? It's interesting because some of the weekly tests are past exam questions. Um, at the very end of term, we will give you some past exam questions. Someone's asking about the time between the end of term and the exams, usually about one week. We're usually one of the first exams that goes up because we're one of the biggest subjects. I think we're one of the biggest subjects at UNSW. Like we're one of those gigantic subjects. Um, so Comp 1511 usually goes at the start of the exam period. They put the big ones at the start of the exam period and then everyone um, fills out the space afterwards with the smaller subjects. So. Uh, this is not a rule, by the way. This is just what I've noticed from scheduling from UNSW. Expect the 1511 exam to be reasonably early in the exam period. Kat was asking, yes, first coding weekly test is released this Thursday and is due by next Thursday. Yes, that's it. Um, uh, Megats is asking, how to prepare for the weekly test, uh, similar questions, papers to practice, I would not. I think that you're going to get the most accurate response out of the weekly test by not preparing. Um, because the more you prepare, the less you're going to know about what you do and don't understand. I think the weekly test is actually there for you to, and I would do it pretty soon after it releases, attempt it for that one hour, see what you do and don't know, go do some study, and then repeat it. Um, you don't have to repeat it under full exam conditions, but you can go back and do the questions. So I'm happy for you to hand it in after you've had extra time to do it. But the trick of the weekly test is it tells you where you're up to. So the more you prepare for it, the more you're kind of making it not necessarily look like where you're up to, because you want to, you just want to use it to get an accurate reading of where you're at. Uh, Alan, it'll be Thursday afternoon. So what we will usually do is do a final checks on it Thursday and release it sometime in the afternoon. And it should be due in the afternoon on Thursday as well. Okay. Oh, Dan's asking the link to the weekly test will be in the tutorials, labs, and tests section on the on WebCMS. Okay. 
So different ways to review code. So we have two different ways I want to teach you about reviewing code to start off with. Um, one will be pair programming or group programming where you're working with lab partners and you're sort of reviewing the code as you write it. So you're, this is like writing code in a group in a sense. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But then there's a more formal review, which is the kind of things that we'll be doing in the tutorials starting next week, um, is that there will be some code. It will go up on the screen. I was going to say projector, but like we're not... Oh, some people are in physical rooms, but not that many people in the course are in physical rooms. Um, but um, it'll go up on screen and then we'll talk about it. So we'll get feedback from people um, in the class about it and the tutor will probably give you some examples of things we might say about code. Um, in, uh, in an industry sense, we would sometimes use formal software tools for this. So we would put code up for review and it would be like a shared document, like a Google Doc or a, um, any kind of online document where people can just put comments in saying, oh, I think this is interesting and stuff. And then we'll get together and talk about what everyone had been saying. So pair programming and group programming in, in our labs, this is a really good place to practice this. So one of the funny things about this, I like to say that myself and a couple of friends when we were teenagers, we invented this. <laughs> we weren't programming at the time, but we were actually playing a really, really old game called Command and Conquer. And this was, this was so old that we were actually dialing. We were calling each other's houses with our modems to talk to each other to link. And so you could only have a one-to-one -one link. There was, like, the internet didn't exist in the, in the version that it is today. So you, we couldn't all just connect to the internet and talk to each other. We had to actually dial the other person's house and have our modems directly talk to each other. Um, showing my age here. We had this really funny thing where we had a pair of brothers who were really, really good at this game. One of them would be on the keyboard and the mouse, and the other one would just be sitting behind him, looking over his shoulder and, and telling him what to do next. And so what we get we got then is one person handling what we call the micro. So individual little actions and things like that were being taken by one person, and the other person was the macro. So they were thinking about overall strategy, and they were thinking about uh, planning how to build their base and, and which units to build next and all this kind of stuff, while the other person was just moving things around. The beauty of that is, and, and they used to beat all of us all the time. It was really hard to beat them because they were, they, they were really thinking that way. They were thinking well. Um, the beauty of that is it works in programming as well. Each person gets to focus on one small part of the overall solving of the problem. Uh, and in doing so, they will do better at that particular task than if they were trying to think about both things at once. Um, so this kind of programming, which is really funny because in the, <laughs> I think it was in the 90s um, when people started using this, they called it extreme programming. <laughs> I just love it. There's, like, there's nothing more 90s than calling it extreme programming. So what are you doing? It's extreme. <laughs> yeah, so it's not that extreme. Um, nowadays we call it pair programming because I think now that we've come out of the 1990s, we don't want things to be as extreme as we used to. <laughs> Does Pepsi Max even still exist? I think that was when that was invented, sometime in that 90s era. Um, so, but the key thing here is that only one person has to worry too much about um, the nitty gritty of whether your C makes sense. But the other person can think about, okay, what is the overall strategy? What is the problem we're solving? Make sure you remember what the problem is so that the code matches up with that. And so you get this beautiful, beautiful combination where, and this is, this is why people still use this a fair bit when they're doing really difficult problems um, in an industrial context, is you're better than two people working individually like that. You will get better code out of it than if you separate the code and work individually on it. So this over the shoulder thing works really well. Um, uh, I encourage you to do this in your labs. So next lab you have, labs coming up this week, I encourage you to try this. Um, you um, have one person, so go into a breakout room, see how your, your, your tutor organizes it, but a lot of tutors have got to organize breakout rooms. You can go into a breakout room with some other people and then designate um, uh, one person to say, um, be the, the keyboard. So they will share their screen and then a couple of other people, or maybe even just one other person can be looking at it, open up your mics and have a chat. 
And so one person can say, so I thought that this would be the way to solve the problem. So this time we're going to be doing looping. So it would be something like someone saying, I think we need to loop through these things and then do these kinds of checks on things as we're looping through. And the other person will be cool. All right, I'll set up the loop and stuff while you think about what kind of checks they're going to be. And then you go back and forth, have the conversation um, and then write the code together. We're totally happy if you've worked on your code like that for two people to submit exactly the same code file. So the person who has um, written the code, physically written the code on their computer is not the only person that's worked on that code. You can both get credit for that. Lab exercises work that way. We're happy to mark a lab exercise which would look exactly like plagiarism in an assignment where they are both literally exactly the same code. Um, but that's what we want you to do in the labs. We want you to learn from each other like that. So this is a really cool way to do it. So this is a way that we can write code and sort of constantly be reviewing the code as we're writing it. So we've got two people working together like that. Um, the other thing that we might do is a more formal code review where one person or even a, a pair or a group of people have already finished writing a piece of code and they take it to other people who haven't seen it before. And they say, can we have a look at this? You can actually volunteer for this. So there's uh, after next week's demo, there will be five more labs after that. You can actually volunteer some of your code uh, in the tutorial for a code review because we'll be starting the majority of the tutorials from here on in with a little bit of a code review, a quick code review of someone's code. So you can say, oh, we did this code. We'd like to put it up for a review. And so you can say, when you put it up for a review, you can say, okay, this is what we've written. This is what it's for. Um, these are the bits that we think is interesting that maybe look at this technique. So this is how we solved this issue. Um, and you, um, as a reviewer, you can look at that code and you can say, hey, uh, in terms of readability, I didn't quite understand what was going on here or here. And that's pretty cool because you can help people to edit their readability about things. Um, one thing to point out, it is hard to put your code up on display. I do understand that it can feel like you're being judged for the code you've written and stuff that you're doing is being picked at. So when we are picking at other people's code, please be nice about it. Please be polite about it. We don't really want to end up in a situation where people don't want to show their code anymore because they've been picked at too much because that can, that can happen. Um, and that's a matter of kind of, um, putting together a dynamic in our groups so that we understand that we're always helping each other, um, rather than poking at each other's stuff. <laughs> um, but things you can do if you are reviewing is talk about whether it is easy or hard to understand the other person's code and why. And it's really, it's really awkward, right? Because a lot of us like to pretend that we understand everything. And when we're pretending that we understand everything, we just go, oh yeah, I totally get that. And you look at it and say, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get what's going on, <laughs> right? It's, it's really good if you can just go, I, I don't really understand what that is. And then it'll be really good because then the, re the person being reviewed can say, oh, yeah, okay, so I understand it, but then maybe I need to figure out how to explain this in the code. Maybe it's not entirely readable. So lots of little things like that are going to help. Um, often when someone puts code up for review, they might highlight a section of it and say, this is a bit I don't fully understand. Yes, I've written it. Yes, it mostly works. Um, one of the best pieces of code you can put up for a review is say, this is a lab exercise from last week. It does not pass all the auto tests, right? Um, uh, so if it's if it doesn't pass all the auto tests, you can say, I'm not sure exactly why, but this is the code that I think the problem is in. And then you can get help with that. Other people can say, oh, there's an issue there. Like, look at that. And if you change it like this, that might work better. And then you can learn a lot from that kind of thing. Um, oh, I think this is, this is following on from the point I was saying before, <coughs> things that might not be as helpful to, to say to people, you did this wrong. Your code is bad. You're a bad programmer. Never do this again. <laughs> things like that are not going to help us learn. We can definitely see things that are wrong with people's code without saying that that is an implication that that person is a bad human being <laughs> and should never write code again. That's not really what we're here for, especially not at this point. Um, we're in our first year here in a introductory programming course. 
which means, look, it's a bit mean, but if we're going to say this, we're all bad programmers. Um, because if we were good programmers, we wouldn't need to be here right now learning this. So I think it's good to remember one thing about learning in general is that everyone starts off god awful at something. Um, there is no one in the world who is good at something who wasn't at some point god awful at it. And, and so what we want is that these code reviews are a chance for everyone to be really bad at stuff and it's totally fine. Um, and working in your labs and stuff, working in Comp 151 and in general is your chance to be really bad at programming um, because the worse you are at it, the more you're going to learn about it as you go along. So if we have this environment where we're not judging people for how bad they are, but we're helping everyone, uh, then we're going to be in a situation where we're all learning more about what we're doing. Okay, so how do we help other people learn. I think this is actually more text about stuff that I've just been saying. Yeah, we're not judging the code by how good it is. Um, we might talk about whether we can understand what someone's doing. We may be able to help people with different ways of doing things. Uh, it's important to think about the fact that there is no single way to solve the problem. Um, and I think uh, this is one of my favorite lines that I've written here, is that you and someone else can be solving a problem in a different way, and you can both be right. So the code itself and how it functions can look completely different from two different people, but can actually end up producing the same results. So just put bear that in mind and also share these ideas with each other. Because you can say, oh, that's really interesting that you did it like that. I did it like this, and they both seem to work. And then you can both look at each other's code and go, oh, that's really cool. All right. And then you've learned something new, and you've learned something different. Um, and also, as I said before, um, telling people what you don't understand is, is actually really valuable. Um, and it's hard to do because a lot of us have this ego inside that says, I'm not going to talk about the things I don't know because I don't want to seem stupid. Um, but I think that that idea of seeming stupid is actually what learning is because we're not in a process of learning if we know the answers. It's when we don't know the answers that we're, we're actually open to learning something new. So. This is what I, I hope that people will get into once you start working a little bit with other people. Um, and this is actually just a good way to approach tutorials in general, is when you don't know something, it's okay to talk about it, right? That's the time that we can elaborate on things. Your tutor can change what they're saying to try to show it a different way. There will actually be examples. I've actually set up a few things like this where I teach you something in a certain way, and then I set it up for the tutors to teach it to you in a subtly different way. So that way, hopefully, when, when you see the same concept from different perspectives, it might be able to teach you more about it. OK, that's everything that I wanted to. Let me just move my face out of the way. Um, that's everything that I wanted to say about uh, code reviews here. But next week in the tutorials, you'll get a demo of your first code review, and you get to see what it's like. Um, and then after that, we can start to try to run our own and things. I would. Um, I would suggest trying the the pair programming uh, style of thing in your um, in your labs this week. So whether you're in breakout rooms or you're in person, in person is a lot more difficult um, because I think we're under social distancing rules. So I think it's actually very hard for someone to sit over someone's shoulder without breaking the social distancing rules. Um, but online it's really easy because you can go into a breakout room with two or three people or so, have one person share their screen and the other two talk to them as they're programming. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Paco's asking, if we work in a pair, one of us submitted using their account, do we have to email you to tell you we work together? If you want to, in the header comment, you can say the, the, the ZIDs of who worked on it, but you're both going to need to submit because our automated marking system is going to submit what, that, what each person submits. So the one thing that you might need to do is make sure that both of you can get a copy of the same file. Um, there is a command that can, co can copy files from one person to another but I have a feeling that that command involves typing in the password. What we'd usually do physically is the other person leans over the keyboard and types in the password, which is probably not that great. You may have to email it to the other person or something like that. We'll see how it goes. Your tutor can help you transfer files between you as well. 
Okay. I'll put my face back up here. So a little bit of technical code. I wasn't going to go a whole lecture without teaching you a, uh, another, another coding technique is functions. So I wanted to talk about this because we've actually already seen these. But, um, oh, Jonathan's asking, do we have a system in place to connect students or just use the forums? Usually we try to connect students inside the lab that you're in so that you're, you're, you're in the same lab session. So your breakout, um, um, your breakout rooms are in the same place. So, um, what it used to be is like, oh, actually for some people, it's like, if you're in physical labs, it's someone in the same class as you. So you could just meet someone randomly there or your tutor can pair you up, um, Sometimes the tutor will just draw names out of a hat and pair people up. Um, I don't know how all the tutors are doing it with online labs and breakout rooms, so we'll just see how that happens. Yeah. Uh, Rubyette's asking, how many people are attending in-person labs? I think there's about 60 or so. I know it's, it's, it's just over 10% of the course at the moment. It's usually just people who are living close to UNSW. So people who think that they can travel to and from UNSW and attend in person without too much risk of, uh, um, uh, of coming in contact with too many people, that kind of thing. Okay, so new technique. We're going to talk about functions. So introducing functions to you is an interesting thing because you actually kind of already know what they are because you have seen some of them main is a function and things like printf and scanf are also functions so let's talk about what these actually are a function is a piece of code that has a name and it's contained inside a set of curly brackets and the way that it works is we can give some information to the function. The function may give some information back to us. And when we call the function, we call it calling a function, is when we use the function by its name and give it some information, and it will run everything that's inside its curly brackets. So we'll have a, we'll have a look at a couple of examples of these and how they work as well. So our main may be considered the way our program is working. Um, so from what we've done so far, we have all the lines inside our main. So inside the curly brackets of our main, we're going to run these line by line. If we have another function, so for example, we run printf. Printf is not just one line. We see it as just one line, but someone else has written printf, and it's like lots of lines of code that is going to say, OK, get access to the terminal put these characters on the terminal. If we see a particular format string, we need to match it up with a variable value, access that variable value, and put that character on the terminal, right? So there's a fair bit of work going on in the background in printf. What happens is when we call printf, we jump. So we jump out of our main to the code that the function has. We run whatever is in that function's code. When that function finishes, we jump back to our main. And we jump back to exactly where we were in our main. So these arrows aren't exactly perfectly accurate. I mean, it's a, it's a loose diagram, right? It's not really meant for exactness. But what it is, is we're jumping out of the main to do something else, and then we're jumping back into the main afterwards when we're finished. So we haven't written, actually it's not technically true. I was gonna say we haven't written any of our own functions yet, but every single program we've been writing has a main function. Um, so we have actually written a lot of functions so far, but we haven't written our own functions to be called from the main yet. So let's have a look at the syntax of how a function is written. And you will see the similarity to the, um, the main function itself had this kind of format where the first line had a variable type, a name, some brackets, and some other variable declarations in here. So what these are. The first one is the output of the function and is also called the function's type as it were. Um, so the type of the function is the information that we would get back from the function. It's nearly when you call a function what the function transforms into. So this example is a really really simple function that adds two numbers together. So I've called it add. That seems like a good name for me. 
Um, and then in the brackets are the information that we give the function. So we're giving it a, an integer called a and an integer called b. We're naming these integers inside the function. Um, so in terms of uh, what goes on inside the curly brackets, these variables, even though they're technically outside the curly brackets, are considered to be created inside these curly brackets. So they don't exist anywhere else, they only exist for this function. But the values that come in are two integers that we give the function. The function does something and it gives back some information. So let's talk about this return keyword here. We've been, um, we've kind of touched on the idea of return, but now we're thinking about what return is in terms of these smaller functions that we're creating. So return is a keyword that says, I will deliver the output of the function. I will also end the function at this point and we don't need to do any more in the function. So for example here, return a plus b, so this, this function is pretty trivial, right? Usually we'd expect a function to need more lines in here to actually do something because if this could just return a plus b, I never needed to put these two numbers in here to do this. But as an example of just how functions work, it still makes sense to us. So return says I have finished this function and I need this thing to give back an integer because this function's type is integer, which means that whatever I'm returning, so whatever comes after the return keyword has to be an integer. And we've seen this a little with the, the return zero, return one we've been doing with our mains, but now it's kind of more functional. So I'm returning a plus b. a plus b is adding two integers to together, which is gonna give me another integer, which means there will be an integer value here that turns into the output there. So this is the right type here, the return matches up. Also, once I've given back the result of this addition, my function doesn't have to do any more work, so it will finish here. I mean, a bit trivial because this whole function only has one line, so it's gonna finish after it's one line anyway. So that's what our return is gonna do. So this allows us to say, this function's gonna go off, do its little bit of work, and return some kind of information to us. Not all functions are actually going to give something back. Some of them don't. But let's have a look at how a function is used. So I've got my in main void here, which is like the, the standard function that we're using. But if we had that add function, so if this add function existed here and it was going to be able to add two integers that we give it together and return an integer, I could call it like this. So I could say add, and I'll give you one integer. And so this integer has been set up as four. This integer has been set up as six. The number four will go in here. The number six will go in here. Add will take four and six as its inputs. It will add them together and will return 10, adding four and six together. And so what happens is the function where it's called here in my code, it goes off and runs and then it comes back and says, I will basically transform myself here into the result of the function. So if it was gonna return 10, this here where I called the function will end up being the number 10. So that turns into the number 10. Number 10 gets stored in this variable total. And so that's what will happen here. We've got our three integers. We've put the two integers into here we actually haven't put the integers themselves. We've just read the values out of them and given them to the function. Um, the function's done its thing and said, okay, when I'm finished, I transform into the result, which was whatever I returned, which is gonna be a plus b here. So we get 10 and then total equals 10. So that's one of the most basic use of functions. If we know the function and it already exists, um, functions like printf and scanf are like that. So long as we know what this is, we can then use it by calling it by name. So it's kind of like a variable in that if we've declared a variable previously, we can then just call it by name and we get access to that variable. The function's gonna work very similarly to that. Um, so one detail of that that I need to talk about is when we're working with variables, for example, our compiler is gonna go line by line, top to bottom. So it's only, as it's reading our code file, it's only gonna know what's happened above. It's never gonna know anything that's happened below the current line that it's working on. So 
An example here, just showing variables and how this kind of line by line thing works. We have our int main void and we declare a variable called number. And we say, okay, that number equals one. And then we have here total equals number plus other number. Other number here is declared as equal to five. And so if we look at this as a human, we can look at it and say, okay, we think that the intention here was the total would be equal to six after this. The issue with C is that when it gets to this line here and says total equals number plus other number, it says, I, I don't know what this one is. We have not going line by line we have not seen other number yet at this point, so we don't know what it is what it is or what its value is, so we can't use it. So this is that idea that our compiler is going to go top to bottom. Um, and so if we wanted to use this other number, it would have to be higher in this somewhere for us to understand it. I think there was a question there. Shrey was saying, good question. Mark will cover that in a second. Let's just see what the question is to make sure. Would you define the function as separate file or just above the main function in the same file? I think we're, yeah, we're getting to that. I always really love it when people ask the questions that are coming up in the next slides. It makes me feel good because it makes me feel like my narrative for the lecture and the, the, the justification of what I'm doing is leading people to think to the, think about the same things that we're, we're talking about. Um, Arugiat's asking, why did we use return a plus b rather than return zero initially? So the return is what value we want to give back when the function finishes. And it depends on what the function is for, what it returns. So the main function was just saying, I'm going to return a number, which is just whether I succeeded or not. Whereas the add function is very different. The add function is saying, I'm going to return a number that is these two numbers added together. So I'm not actually going to be returning a code for whether I ended correctly or not. I am actually going to be returning a value that makes sense. So we're using this as a function to, to add two numbers together, as opposed to just a function that does all kinds of things and then just has a code for whether it finishes or not. So we don't actually have a return zero in this add because that would imply that adding these two numbers together equals zero. But instead, we want to add these two numbers together and give back some information. And the return gives back that information. The main function, the only information the main function was giving back was whether it had finished or not. Um, whereas these other sub functions, I guess we could call them, we're probably not really going to be, really going to be calling them sub functions. They're actually going to be functions. Um, they're going to be returning useful information. Some of them will return nothing. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. so. Things we're talking about is ordering of things. So in order to use something in C, we have to know what it is, which means we have to have it above. Functions we are going to be doing like that. And then this is where things jump around a little bit here. We are going to be declaring functions here, saying this is a function that exists. Um, these are the inputs to the function, and this is the output to the function, and this is the name. If we have that, then we can call the function. We actually don't need the whole function. We can just have that much information about the function. We'll be able to call the function somewhere in the code that follows. So in the main that follows or in other functions, that kind of thing. Um, and when this runs, it'll, it will then be able to look through the whole file. So compiling is one thing and then running is later. When something runs, the whole file has already been compiled. So when we run this, it will be able to see all of this code and we'll go, okay, this add function, sorry, when I'm pointing at it, the uh, Google Slides overlay <laughs> covers up the code. Um, <clears throat> when we're running it, we will actually go down to that bit of code and run it there. So this setup has some subtleties of why it's like this. So one of the questions that I get a lot when I show this is why don't we put this whole function up here? Um, there's, there's a couple of different reasons why that happens. One is that in the future we're going to split these into multiple files and it's actually easier to do this in this way. The other thing is if I have multiple functions that use each other, it's better that all of the functions know what all the functions are before they start running, which is why the body of the functions are down here and just the one liner that says what the function is, is at the very top. So. I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but we will see why this happens later on. When we see a function that uses another function, um, 
they will need to know all the functions that exist and then they will use some of them themselves. Um, so that's why we have just a small listing of functions here and then the body of the functions below the main. So it's nearly like we've got a contents at the top, we've got the main story and we've got these kind of appendixes of extra information afterwards. Kevin's saying, how can the function be used before it's fully written? So it's interesting, right? Because this is saying, I will, when I run, I will connect this up with something else. I don't know what it is, but I know enough to check whether I'm allowed to use this. So if I'm checking whether I'm allowed to use this, I say this thing turns into an integer and it's getting stored in an integer. That's good. This thing takes in two integers here, int a and int b, and we are giving it first number is an int, second number is an int. So we're giving it a 4 as its a and a 6 as its b. So I can say, this is legal, you may continue. But when you actually do dot slash run, uh, dot slash program to run it, all of this stuff has already been processed by then, which means it already knows that this exists once you try to use it. So there's some subtlety there, uh, Kevin, about that. Um... And Josh is asking, can we declare a function and define it together, like how we would declare a variable and assign it? It's technically possible. We could put this code above the main here, and that would be declaring and defining at the same time. We don't necessarily do that because there's a lot of the subtleties that happen with functions because they're more complicated with variables. I'm going to teach you this format now. We're going to use this, but as we get deeper, I'll show you why um, this, this works. Um, because it's not just style, it's actually some functions will not work unless they're done in this format. But I don't want to, I don't want to bamboozle you with too much detail just yet. I just want to show you the things and how they work and then we'll get into more of it later. Um, Eric was saying, wait, doesn't everything in the curly brackets stay in the curly brackets? Nearly. <laughs> so everything in these curly brackets are, <laughs> I just want to point at this thing. Hang on, hang on, one minute, dude. There you go. So, in these curly brackets here, oops, these variables are existing inside these curly brackets. So A and B don't exist anywhere in this main. So they've got first number and second number, they give the values in there, and A and B happen in here. The return does, in a sense, give some information back. But it doesn't really exit the curly brackets as much as transform this entire function into this result. Because this function is an integer function, which means that this function is nearly, you can nearly think of this function as an integer. So because this function is an integer type, it means that when it, when it finishes running, it will turn itself into an integer. So the a plus b is the integer that it returns. And that is the result that ends up being kind of placed here in the main when this thing finishes running. So we get to here, this thing jumps out, it runs, and when it returns a plus b, that is the value that this thing ends up becoming. And that's an integer type, and then it can be placed in the integer there. Okay, I'll go back to what I'm talking about. The other thing that I hadn't uh, said much yet about before, but we've seen this keyword before in our main, is void. Um, so void, as you can kind of guess from the word itself, means empty or nothing. Um, and so sometimes we are going to have a function that has a type void, which means that the function does not return any information. The function does not transform into a variable value or anything like that. It simply runs and ends. Now note that this function here does not have return in it. So it doesn't give back any information. So some functions, we don't take any information back from them. And that can seem weird because we can say, why are we even running the function if we're not gonna get any information back? But the trick about this is it does something. So this function is there to perform a task and not necessarily tell us anything about it. So this one's interesting in that it's performing the same task of adding two numbers together. But this time, instead of adding them together and giving them back to us as an integer, this one prints it out to the screen. 
So this is like, add these two numbers together and give them to my user. I, as the program, don't need to know anymore what the value was. Um, I'm not interested in it, but I think the user is interested in it, so print this out for the user. Um, printing out stuff to the user is one of the most common things that we use a void function for because we know it has a side effect that we need to have happen, but it doesn't give any information back to the program itself, so I can have void functions like that. So we've kind of got two different kinds of functions. One function does some processing and gives us information, and that'll be a function with a type. So that function can be int or it can be a double for the moment. Those are the only types we have. Um, or I can have a void function where I can't use a void function to assign a value or anything like that. The void function is just going to do its thing and then finish. Um, sometimes we can use the return keyword in void functions, but that will only be used to end the function prematurely. Um, so we may see some examples of that. Um, but usually a void function just runs to, to, to the finish. Uh, Ian's asking, are functions algorithms? Algorithms are nearly, you could think of them as a recipe for doing something, and you would use a function to what we would say implement an algorithm to make this idea work. Um, so it's nearly like an algorithm is a recipe and a function is the actual cooking of it. I don't know if that analogy is perfect, but you can kind of see there's different levels there. Okay, wrapping it up there. Don't worry too much if you're confused about functions, we're going to start using them on Friday. So I'm gonna go into more detail, but I wanted to plant the seed in your head of what these things can do. So today we looked at code style. So we looked at a lot of little techniques that we can use. We looked at bad code as well, but we looked at all the different tricks we can use to make our code as readable as it can possibly be. Uh, we also looked at code reviews, which wasn't just code reviews, but it was about the idea of how do we collaborate with other people on our code so that everyone can understand it as we're doing it. Um, and also how we can present our code to other people and learn from other people. And then we looked at functions as well, which was our first taste of how we can write separate pieces of code that aren't necessarily running line by line anymore. We're running top to bottom, then we're jumping to another piece of code, running it top to bottom, and then jumping back where we were. So that's the, the kind of thing we're gonna be using functions for. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, I will go to my um, break screen for a bit and I'll come back and answer any questions people have afterwards. All right, I'm back. I have downloaded, in case people want to look at it now that we're post-lecture and you want to peek at things, um, I've just downloaded the, hang on, I'm just gonna, there's a keyword here you can use if you want to, if things are getting messy in your terminal, you can type in clear, and then you get um, you get a fresh, uh, um, fresh look at your terminal. So I downloaded function demo.c which was in the lecture section here, functions demo. Um, so there's some code here to look at if we want to. Uh, 
Um, what was that tray? Control L? What was that for? I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, so we have um, some examples of the functions here. So these are the two functions that are in the in the lecture slides and some examples of how we might use them. So I think we've got three and seven instead of four and six here. But um, what we're seeing is how we declare the functions. And so we've got an integer based function here and a void function here. And I did these in the other um, uh, the other naming scheme called snake case. So you can see the difference here. Each of these takes in two integers. And then given those two integers, it will do something. So the integer function is going to give back an integer, which means that if we run this one here, it gives back an integer, which is the total of three and seven being added together. And because it gives back a number, it can then be stored in a variable. Print add does not give back any numbers, so I can't do this. Oh, right, control L for clearing the terminal, yeah. So I can't do int total equals print add because the print add function is a void function. So if it's a void function, it does not transform itself into anything when it runs. So this, I can't assign this because this doesn't have a value. This one is guaranteed to have an integer value because I've said that it will be an integer function. And in doing that, I've made sure it returns some kind of value, which is what an integer function has to do. It has to return an integer or else it doesn't function properly. Whereas the void function here does not have a return. It doesn't transform itself into any value. So because it doesn't do that, we can't give it to a value like that. So this function will run, us as humans won't see any response here because there's nothing going to printf or anything, but it will change this total here. Print add will not give anything back to the program, but the program will run it and we'll go out here and we'll say, yeah, I'm also able to add these things together. But the only thing that I'm going to do there is, is print out this response to, to the user. If anyone's got any questions, Feel free to throw questions in the chat now and I will answer them. Um, otherwise I can keep kind of talking about the subtleties of this and running it and stuff. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, Kevin's saying that you don't get it. Um, so what can the return function? Oh yeah, okay, okay, so there's a couple of people lost. That's cool. Um, so Kevin's saying, what can the return function do? So what return can do is it will link up with this type. So if we're going to return an integer, so this is going to be an integer, a plus b, this is what this function here will end up being. So if I just do another printf here, we can demo this running. Um, total is something. I'll put a new line on the end of that and the variable total. So what this will show us is if we add these two numbers together, um, the add function will take in first, which is this variable here. So the number three goes in here as a, then second will get given to the function. So the number B here will be seven. So we're gonna get a three and a seven in here when this is called here, because it gets called with those values being passed to it in a sense. So here, three and seven, three plus seven is 10. Return says, I will give you back something. And this is A plus B is 10 here. And we could have done this this way, or we can do this like this, where we can say int result is equal to a plus b return result. We can do it like that as well. So long as whatever we're returning, so whatever the first thing after the return is, is an integer. So a plus b is an integer because that will, um, once you add the numbers together, it becomes an integer. 
that can be returned or you can set up an integer that can be returned. Um, it's up to you. As these things get more complicated, um, you will do a whole lot of code, but it will boil down to a single value coming back out of this type of function. Um, um, and Izzy is asking, so if you run print add, then you don't get the variable result to use in, in the rest of main. Yeah, you don't. Because print add is a void, which means that when it's done here, it does not transform into anything. Add as a function is an integer function. So when it's finished running, it transforms itself into an integer in place here. So if I run this with a three and a seven, um, three and seven becomes a result. Result is 10. Um, the result is returned. If it's the value that's returned, then this turns into that value. So it's nearly like doing this. That's only what will happen after it runs though. You can't just type this number in there because you can use the add function with different values, right? But in this case, in this program, that would be equal to 10. Um, So let's look at print add. Uh, Kevin's saying, isn't returning the same as giving a value back? Yes, Kevin, you are correct. Returning is giving a value back. So returning specifically says, you wanted an integer, I give you an integer. Print add does not return anything. It is a void, so it can't be used as a value. So this will never transform into anything that can be stored. So I can't have int result equals this because I can't put a void into an integer like a void is empty it has no information so this one instead says I will give some information to the user I have figured out it's the same result because it's still a plus b but this main here knows nothing about it my user might get the information but the information never comes back to the program with a void function Um, Dan's asking, um, you're not sure what the return part does. So the return part says, I will finish this function, and this is the thing that the function gives back. So the function said before it started, I will give you back an integer. The return says, this is the integer I'm giving you back. So this result is a plus b so whatever these numbers were in this case when we called this we gave it three and seven if we gave it three and seven we added three and seven together and we got ten then this is the value ten and this um function call here gets transformed into the number ten um Oh, Anthony's asking about the, the lecture. The lecture's technically over. This is just anyone hanging around afterwards who wants to ask any questions. So if you have, this is basically, if you had a tutorial starting at one, um, head over to the tutorial because there's nothing in this section afterwards that you 100% need. Um, this is just anyone who wants clarification afterwards. Um, Isaac is saying, so return is just like sending the value back to the main program. Yes. And the, where that value goes back to the main program is wherever the function was called. So it goes in right here and kind of replaces this line in a sense so that that value can then be stored here. Um, uh, Kevin is saying, what's the difference between returning the sum and printing the result sum in a terminal? Is the difference that the value for total is stored afterwards? Yes. So I now have this integer, which means I can use that to, to check other things. So I can say if total greater than 10, for example, then do something. Whereas with this function, I never know in my main, in my program, I never actually know what the total is. I've given it to the user. Um, that happened to be what I did with it, but I can't do any more further calculations with it like I could with this. So one of these functions is saying, I give you back the value, and the other is saying, I'm just used 
for a specific purpose and I don't give any information back. Uh, Osama is asking, why didn't we just define and write down the functions before the main one? Isn't that more readable? Um, yes and no. I think it's actually less readable because I want the main function to be as close to the top of the program as possible. The other reason why we might not do that, <clears throat> let me do an edit on this and show you why we might not do that. So let's say I've got my add and my print add and I'm just going to do some chopping and changing here. I'm going to put both of these <coughs> up here. One of the things that we could do um, I'm contriving this a little bit, but this definitely happens with different functions. So I'm going to put my print add above my add here to show you an example of some of the issues. So I could have in result equals a plus b, or I could try to do in result equals add a and b. Because I know I've got a function somewhere that adds two numbers together. I mean, this is like, this is me kind of stretching this to make it work. But now my print add needs add to be able to run. So that would mean that print add would have to go after add. Um, but what could happen with a lot of these different functions happening, once things get more complex, is you have a chain of things needing other things. And so you don't want these things in a strict order. What you want is for every function to know all of the other functions that exist and to be able to use all of them without needing one to be before something else in the list. So the way I've done this now, if I have all the functions above, this means that print add always has to be after add because it needs to know what add is before it can work, um, which means we have forced an order of things at the top of our list here. But there could be other functions once I have, like, because it's quite conceivable we have like 20 or 30 functions in even a reasonably simple program could have all these functions. If they all have dependencies of other functions that they want to use, then we have really fixed in what order these things can be. And we could end up with a conflict where there's actually no way to order these so that they can all use each other. And so that's why we don't put the whole functions up here because it leads to those kinds of unnecessary complexity. Whereas if we say all of the functions are declared there, which means everything below, all the code that's written can use all of the functions, um, then we don't have these ordering issues. Okay, I'm going to put these back the way it was. Uh, all right. So in this case, oh wait, here, all of our functions down here can use anything that's up here, including our main can use anything that's up here, regardless of any kind of um, dependency for one function knowing what the other function is. So I can use functions within functions and other functions that use other functions without caring about the order that things are. So it makes things a lot simpler like that. So I've got my checklist of all the functions that I could use and then I can use any of them here rather than saying, I can only use the functions that are higher than me in the program. <clears throat> so hopefully that helps you with, with understanding why this particular layout exists. I don't want to go into too much detail uh, during the lecture because I just wanted the basic concept of it first, and then we'll go into it further later on. OK, um, other questions? Uh, Grant's asking whether functionally that makes a difference whether the function's above or below. It doesn't. <clears throat> so the body of the code, regardless of where it is, is what runs. The only difference is that everything down here knows everything that happened above to a certain extent. So it knows that these other functions have been declared. So it kind of actually does make a difference. If I put this up there, then there are other functions it won't know about, whereas down here it knows about all the other functions. So there's things that are slightly different like that. Um. 
Kevin's asking, why would we ever want to use void when we can store that return value in case we need to use it later on? Void is there often for functions that have no return. So let me, let me write a function where there's no possible value to return, but we still might want it to run. So um, let's, uh, I'm going to make a void function called rickroll. And it has no input either. Just from last time. Um, so void rickroll. Did I put a semicolon at the end of it up there? I think I did. Yep. Actually, let's 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 go all in on this. <laughs> this is a very bad function. Never write a function like this. But this <laughs> this void function here has no value to give back. If it has no value, it can give back to us then there's nothing that I could put here. But I still might want it to do something. So if I want something to do something, it has no possible value to give back, then I could do it with a void function. I mean, I guess if I really, really wanted this to have an integer, then I could do the thing that I do with the main, where I return zero or something. But often I have functions where it's like, no, there's no, there's no reason why this thing should have a value to come back. So it will just do its thing and then stop, you know? So, and as we get deeper, as we get into more subtleties of programming, we'll see other ways we can use void functions. But for now, uh, a void function is something that just maybe doesn't have a value necessarily. That's one reason why it exists. Other reasons why void functions exist is sometimes they will change something in our main, but they won't give us back information, but they'll still change something in there. But we're gonna get to that later. Okay. Awesome. So Osama and Grant, I answered your questions, I think, when I when I was talking about the ordering of functions there. Uh, Trent's saying, how does simply declaring a function without defining it mean its contents are known to other functions? Now, this is an interesting thing. The contents aren't known, but the link is known. So in order to use another function, you need to know whether the inputs and outputs you're doing are legal. So the only way we can know whether the inputs and outputs are legal is if they're clearly defined. So in the declaration, they're clearly defined that this is going to give you back an integer and it's going to take two integers in, which means I can write the code saying, I'm calling the add function and I'm doing the right things with the add function. So I'm doing the right things. I'm storing it in an integer and it is an integer and I'm giving it two integers because it asked for two integers here. This means that my code can compile knowing that it is correct. So when it's correct, it can translate it and go, okay, this is what we're going to do. Then when it runs, when we, because when we compile, for example, let's just, let's actually do it. Did control L to clear that. Uh, Shrey's advice there. Um, so we're going to DCC, um, what was it called? Function demo. Function, oh, I haven't saved that. Although I didn't need to save that because the only thing I added was the rickroll, which is a very, very bad function we should never use. Um, okay, so we'll call it function demo. Okay, so at this point, at this point, what has happened is DCC has gone through this and read it line by line, one line at a time, and processed that into translated code. So what it's done then is it said, I have a function called add, I have a function called print add, and a function called rickroll. When I went through all this code, I made sure that these variables lined up so that they worked. And then I went through all of these things and turned them into a set of instructions so that the computer can run. 
and I've attached their names to those sets of instructions. Now, if I type in dot slash function demo and run it, what that then does is it goes to the main and starts running this line by line. So it goes to this line, sets up these two variables, gets to this line and says add. Okay, so now I need to run the add function. Because previously I translated this into a set of instructions that I can run, because that was part of the DCC step, I can now jump here, run this stuff, and then jump back here. The reason why we needed this initially was the compiler had to know that if we wanted to use this, it was going to have the right inputs and outputs. It was going to be correct, but I didn't have to know everything that it did until I run it. When I run it, then I go, okay, now let's take those inputs, create actual variables for them inside this scope, start using them, return the result, and then come back. So there's this kind of multiple step process in what we're doing there that, that gives us the, um, uh, the, the kind of subtleties of the timing of how this stuff works. So I hope, I hope Trent that answers it. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, Osama is saying, wait, so add first second is a function. This here is the calling of the function. So here we have the, the declaration of the function. This is me saying a function will exist trust me code, a function will exist that takes two integers and gives one back, and is called add. Um, this is me saying I want to use that function at this point in my main. So when my main runs, I want to use the function. And here is me saying, when you see that add, I want you to go line by line through here and make that thing work. So we can consider add to be a function, but add first second to be the, um, the calling of the function. So this is not the function itself, but this is saying, I know that this function exists, please run it once, you know? So this function is a reusable piece of code. And every time I use it inside, I call it by name inside another function. So inside a running piece of code. So if it's between curly brackets, it means it can run. And so in that running piece of code, I say call add, this is where we jump to this, execute these instructions inside the curly brackets, and then jump back with whatever value it was created as. Yes, awesome. <laughs> I, I always love I always love that when we go into the details and stuff, having people go, yeah, okay, now I get it, right? So I think, I, I, just, I just love looking at chat and just seeing, right, yes, now I get it and stuff. So I hope a lot of people are getting getting ideas of what's going on here. Uh, Dan is asking, is it possible if we put the function first, I think you're about to type something else, then put the input later? I will wait. I think I have caught Dan in the middle of talking. <laughs> or was that the whole question? Okay, so something about putting the function first and then the input later. So is this like declaring the function here and then not knowing what the input's going to be until you've created it? I'm not sure exactly what your question is, Dan. This one. Oh, I think I've got your question. So if we did something like this. So if we say there's a function, that's not even a function, by the way. It's only a function if it has brackets. Um, so if I say there's a function called add, but I don't tell you what the inputs are until here, the weird thing about this, um, I think this is what you're asking. The weird thing about what happens here is these aren't the same function. So this is add with no inputs. This is a different function. 
also called add, but because it has different inputs, it's identified by the, the compiler as not being the same function. So the, it is actually possible to have functions, more than one function with the same name. Actually, I'm not sure about this. I just caught myself because I might be doing C++ right now. Um, I know that not everything in C is um, is exactly the same as in C++. I know in C++ I can have two different functions with the same name and they can have different inputs. I'm not sure if I can do that in C or not. I mean, I, I usually hardly ever have two functions that do different things with the same name. That is a scary proposition. Um, because uh, it's it's for human confusion. However, what's going to happen here is if we have a function called add that takes no inputs, and then we try to call add here with two inputs, this is where our compiler is going to complain. It's going to say to us, I don't know what this function is. I know that there's a function called add, and it has zero inputs. You tried to put two inputs into a function with zero inputs. That does not work, even if this exists. And the other issue that our compiler might have is it might say that, actually, no, no, I think that's fine. It will allow all of this, but it will say that we can't call this. So it thinks that I made one function called add with no inputs, and I made a different function called add with two inputs. Let's compile this. I want to see what the error is. I'm, I'm assuming the error will be here. I've called a function that doesn't exist, but I want to see for sure. No! Oh, wow! That is not what I was expecting. <laughs> I will always be surprised, and I think this is always really interesting, I will always be surprised by how long I have been programming and how long I've been assuming that things are a certain way just because I've kind of followed a set of rules and I'm at a period in my in my programming nowadays where I, I, and I obviously think this, but it's not true, but I think that I'm so experienced that I don't need to experiment anymore. Um, and it's obviously not true because me now doing this experiment based on Dan's question there is that maybe I didn't know something about C. Maybe there's, there's still things that I don't understand even about basic C like this. Having said that, back to your points there Dan declare the function do the main and then define the function later that is exactly um, the, the way that I that I'm teaching here which works is we declare the function and then we have our main program so that the first bit of running code that a person sees when they read it is the main bit of running code and then afterwards we have all the things that we could use um, Okay, so I want to find out what's going on here. I've got a function called add here, and I've allowed that to happen. I've called a function called add, which has first and second in it, even though at this point I shouldn't be able to do that. And then here I have an add with multiple variables. So I compiled this, and it compiled. And that's super weird because I don't understand how the compiler can get to this line and understand it because that doesn't have inputs. So let's run this and see what happens. Maybe it'll crash. Maybe I didn't save my file. Have I not saved this? I have saved it. I'm saving it again, just in case, and I'm going to compile it again because it doesn't feel right. It's still compiled, and it still runs. <laughs> Stray is furiously Googling right now, but you're saying it is allowed? I am unsure how this is working 
But it might be that this declaration of the variable is not caring about what the inputs were. And it's still linking up with this one? All right, Trey, what have we got here? Because I am... I've backed myself into a corner here. I don't actually know what... <laughs> yes! Jaws. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> right? I've just shut down. I was like, I don't know. Okay. Trey has found some information. When you declare a function with an empty argument list, as in empty argument list here, no arguments, you invoke K and R, pre-prototype semantics, and nothing is assumed about the parameter list. Oh, okay. It was what I kind of guessed as we were doing it. This ad is still linking up with this, but it is saying, I don't know yet what the inputs are going to be, but here are some inputs that will work. You know what, I, I, I know what this is for. This is for this. I'll show you why this exists. So I have a function called add, and here's one version of add that adds two numbers together. And I can have another one like this. Think that this will work. Uh, Anurag here is saying, is this overloading of functions? Yes. So this is the idea that one function could have multiple different possibilities. I'll see if this works. By the way, this is totally off lecture. This is like way past the content that I'm intending on teaching you right now. We never use two different functions with the same name in 1511. But sometime later on in a programming career, you might be able to see this working. Um, yeah, so Shrey, this might be, um, this might be me doing C++ in C. Because this will work in C++, but I don't know if it works in C. So let's try this, and let's try going um, int new total is equal to add total first second. So let's see if this thing can differentiate between the different adds, or it says you can only have one function of each name. Nope. Warning unused variable, that's fine. Seems that the variable new total, blah, blah, blah. Then the error, conflicting types for add. Previous definition is here. So what I tried to do was C++ overloading in C, which doesn't exist. In C++, you can have... This is the problem of, like, I, I worked as a C++ developer for I don't know how many years, um, but it ended up being my, um, my native language, and so it's like me... What I'm doing, in a sense, is it's like I speak... Um, American English and I'm teaching you British English in a sense, they're not that different, but I think in this other dialect of it, which is the C++ thing so I thought that would work, but it doesn't okay, so this does not work, we will remove this and we will remove this attempt here but the thing that did work was not knowing yet what the inputs are going to be and then adding them later still allows us to use it, hoping that this will be the right thing to match up with this. Um, JD, will we be touching on functions again anytime soon? Yes. So um, I only spent 20 minutes on it today, and any topic that we're going to use, I will never only spend 20 minutes on. So. What I did was just introduce the concept, and on Friday I'm going to do a demo of us building something. And as we solve a problem, we're going to look at things and we're going to say, this is a bit of code that's going to run that might be reused. Oh, this would be something that could work pretty well to put into a function. And then we're going to take the code out of the main and put it into a function. So I'm going to show you much more practicality of how we'd actually go about this as we're building it. Um, also, Tutes and Labs next week will go over functions. Because um, we've got two things we're, we're adding this week, which is functions 
and um, this thing called arrays, which where we store collections of variables together. And then we're going to be going over in the Tude Lab how to use functions and arrays um, next week. <laughs> Yeah, Shrey, so you picked it, which is really cool, um, that this was not going to, to work in C, and it's my, uh, my issues with, um, with, with working natively in a different language that um, made me think it might work. Okay, so that's interesting. I know that, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the rule to remember is because C++ was developed later than C, Everything that you write in C runs in C++, but not everything you think of in C++ runs in C. So this is the this is the hilarity that you're going to get into once you start learning lots of programming languages, is that sometimes you accidentally write one programming language when you're supposed to be writing another. Um, but yes, well done, Trey. That was really good. Um, OK, I think we've answered everyone's questions. Um, and I hope that everyone who stuck around has sort of learnt a little bit more about the subtleties of functions. And, and I think one thing that was really, really good is knowing that you can see that both Shrey and I did not fully understand um, all of the exact details of what's going on there. And programming languages are really, really big, complex things. So it's worth always picking at them, experimenting with them, knowing that you're not going to know everything about them, but having a good idea about how you're going to look things up if you need to, and how you're going to um, sort of accept that um, not knowing everything is something that you're going to have to live with. Uh, and looking things up and trying to figure out how things work is very important. So we did a whole lot of experimentation there. Some things were successful, some things were not not successful. But the result is we learned so much more about the um, about the language from that. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone. I will see you all on Friday. We will look at functions in more detail on Friday, and I'm going to add some other concepts as well. And we're going to do that kind of thing that I do sometimes, where we build up a whole program of stuff on Friday as well. All right. See you later.